So this is process of human diseases one, um, unit seven on respiratory disorders. So to start out with, we're going to review um, a little bit about the anatomy of respiratory system. So the figures that are in your textbook, but they're also here. So uh, when we look at it, the the upper respiratory uh, is nasal cavity, the mouth, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeal pharynx. Um, then the trachea. So and the uh, the thyroid cartilages, the Adam's apple, as it were, where the epiglottis is, um, and then we go into the lower the uh, the bronchi, from the primary bronchi right to the terminal bronchi, the alveola, uh, where the gas exchange happens. The there is a conducting zone right from right here down to the uh, to the respiratory bronchi uh, the respiratory bronchioles and the respiratory zone is where gas exchange actually happens respiratory bronchioles um, and alveolar structures the alveolar structures look like bunches of grapes there's the terminal bronchiole is where the Conducting zone ends. The respiratory bronchiole actually has uh, the ability to do gas exchange, uh, and they lead into these clusters of alveoli. Each alveoli is the little bubble. Um, there's pores that join the two of them. There's canals, etc. Um, but this is where the majority of gas exchange happens. Um, the bronchi uh, at the in the upper part of the the bronchial tree from the trachea in the major bronchi we have cartilage uh, that keep the the air passages open uh, as we get further and further down the tree into the smaller and smaller bronchioles we get um, we get more and more muscle and less and less cartilage. The cartilage becomes less and less uh, structured and the amount of smooth muscle goes up. The lungs are divided into segments uh, and lobes. So upper lobe has got three segments on the right, uh, left there's, there's five, there's a middle lobe uh, on the right hand side uh, there's lower lobes on both sides there's about 10 segments in in the uh, lower lobes you'll notice that there's the same number of segments left and right it's just that the right side is an upper and middle where the left is just an upper So really, this is the, uh, the more the crux of this this course. This is a patho course. So we're going to look at alterations. So as as you can remember from AMP, there are a couple of processes. Um, so there is ventilation, the act of breathing, moving air in and out of the lung spaces. There is. Uh, external respiration, which is the exchange of gases at the alveoli. That's the bringing oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide and other waste products out of the body happen there. Uh, then there is the whole idea of transport. We have to carry these gases to the tissues that they're needed. And then we have internal respiration, which is the exchange of these gases at the tissues. Um, all four of these processes end up being uh, important. And the, each one of these processes can screw up. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice in respiratory um, pathology, as it were, is that a lot of the symptomatology looks the same. And that's 
really because this is a chain of events from ventilation right through to internal respiration. And if that chain gets disrupted anywhere, then oxygen will not be delivered to the tissue and uh, there will be a lack of ATP. Um, and it doesn't really matter where the chain gets interrupted, it will all result in the same thing. And therefore, very, very similar in a lot of the um, symptomatology. So uh, we'll start out with problems of ventilation. And basically, you, you've got two choices, or three choices, I guess. You can ventilate normally, which is physiology, or you can overventilate or underventilate. So underventilating is hypoventilation. So you're not moving enough air to the respiratory zone, through the conducting zone, to, to meet the body's oxygen needs or to take away the carbon dioxide because both of them um, are important. So this is anything that causes a decrease in the rate and or depth of respiration, of breathing. Uh, I, I don't like the term respiration because it gets confusing with the gas exchange, external and internal respiration. So it's really the decrease or the in the rate or depth of breathing. So it can happen because of a lot of things. One of the things is, is um, side effects of drugs, particularly the barbiturates uh, or morphine. And what these things do is they act on the brainstem, on the respiratory centers of the brainstem, and they cause a decrease in the, the respiratory drive. Um, it's a side effect of of those drugs um, and whether they're taken recreationally so like heroin is a derivative of morphine uh, barbiturates are abused uh, by people or whether they're given in a clinical setting for uh, and these would just be side effects it is a very real and common etiology of a hypoventilation. Obesity is another cause, and you don't really think about it, but somebody with a real big gut uh, may have trouble actually having the diaphragm move enough to, uh, to allow adequate ventilation, especially in a sitting position. Uh, sometimes uh, even laying down, laying on your back, the if you're, there's enough obesity, it can push up on the diaphragm uh, and make it difficult to ventilate enough. There's an autoimmune disease called myasthenia gravis. And what myasthenia gravis is, is um, it, it is an autoimmune attack on the acetylcholine receptors at the... Um, at the synapse between the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle fiber. And uh, so basically skeletal muscles don't work. They can't be stimulated because the receptors to the acetylcholine are being destroyed. So this leads to uh, weakness in all kinds of muscles, including the respiratory muscles. Uh, so it can, it can cause uh, this hypoventilation. Obstructive uh, apnea, chest wall damage. You can't breathe as deeply if you got broken ribs. Uh, respiratory muscle paralysis for whatever reason, uh, tetanus or um, there are various drugs. Sometimes they, they give drugs um, during surgery that do, do this on purpose. They try and uh, immobilize people, Karari. Uh, would do this. So things like that, um, anything that causes hypoventilation. Um, hyperventilation is anything that increases the air to the uh, alveoli. And it, it means that you blow off too much uh, 
carbon dioxide. So you end up with hypocapnia, less than 35. Remember, it's 35 to 42 from the last section. You get, um, you get hypoxic stimulation on the, the chemoreceptors. Um, so, so, so what happens is you're just moving so quickly that you're not getting, uh, not getting it proper ventilation. It's too much. You're blowing off. You're not getting the correct gas exchanges. So, um, real common causes are are anxiety. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger causes. People having panic attacks will hyperventilate. Uh, less common. Uh, well, actually, pain and fever are pretty common, too. People that are in a lot of pain do uh, hyperventilation. Um, less common are brainstem injuries uh, and, and things like that. Uh, sometimes uh, restrictive lung diseases, it's counterintuitive, but it, it seems that uh, what people do is they over, they try and overcompensate. And... Uh, for the obstruction and they can end up in a hyperventilation uh, place. And the big problem with this is, is inappropriate amounts of oxygen and or inappropriate amounts of carbon dioxide. With that, also as you know from the last section, acidosis and alkalosis which affect metabolic pathways everywhere so uh, so ventilatory failure is uh, is when we don't get this ventilation so uh, so we have this hypoventilation at the alveoli. Uh, it could be from airways blocked. Uh, it, so sputum will do it. Um, so that's, you know, they, they can't cough up uh, and get rid of that mucus. Um, uh, hypertrophy of uh, the mucosa or edema of the mucosa, uh, especially in the, the larger bronchi. So if the mucosal layer gets thick and the, the, that makes the lumen get smaller, then the uh, airway resistance goes way up. Um, Another way that this can happen is a loss of airway structure. So uh, this could be trauma to the neck, uh, which will collapse the trachea. Um, things like that. Getting kind of punched in the throat, I guess, would, would do it. Um, another common thing is... Uh, smooth muscle contraction of the bronchi, uh, especially hyperactive or in, in response to some sort of an irritant. So this this is I mean, typically asthma. Uh, and so it's failure when you're you're not providing the ventilation that's necessary. What causes you to breathe in is pressure changes. When uh, the chest wall moves out, it creates a low pressure. We learned in AMP that uh, this is called Boyle's Law. When volume increases, pressure decreases. So you expand the chest wall, you lower the diaphragm, you create a lower pressure uh, in the pleural space. That lower pressure in the pleural space uh, 
that means that the the uh, pleural space gets bigger pressure goes down that means that the pleural the intrapleural pressure goes lower than the intra lung pressure which then means that the lungs chase the pleura and they expand when the lungs expand due to Boyle's law the pressure in the lungs goes down when it goes below atmospheric pressure pressure moves through the bronchial tree and the lungs fill with air expiration is the exact opposite now the important thing to realize here is that Expanding the chest wall lowers the pressure intrapleurally, and then that lower pressure of the in the intrapleural space lowers the pressure in the lungs, and those are separate spaces. And so it, the lungs are not attached to the chest wall. This will become important in, in, in a, a few minutes in a, in some of the other pathologies. So if we have problems with this um, ventilation, it's going to lead directly to problems of the gases and the, the number of gas, the amount of gas, just because you're, you're not moving enough air. So there's something, um, a definition, hypoxemia, emia means blood, so hypoxemia means a deficit of oxygen in the blood. Okay. Hypoxia means not enough oxygen in the tissues. Okay. Um, it's a decreased delivery of oxygen. Now you can get hypoxia for a bunch of reasons. So uh, you have normal blood, normal capability, but there's not enough partial pressure of oxygen uh, to, uh, to perfuse, to, to get there. So this is called hypoxy, hypoxia. Uh, so this is anything where there is not enough ventilation. Not enough ventilation leads to hypoxic hypoxia. Or not enough oxygen in the air that is ventilated. So, so you, hypoventilation will do it. Airway obstruction will do it. Uh, but also high altitude will do it because the partial pressure of oxygen at high altitude is too low. Uh, I'm going to also assume that... Uh, being trapped in a closed container will do it uh, as you use up the oxygen in the in the container. Now there's anemic hypoxia, and this happens. You're ventilating enough, but there's a decreased carrying capacity. There's not enough hemoglobin. Uh, so anything that causes decreased hemoglobin. So kidney disease that where there's not enough erythropoietin made. There won't be enough red blood cells and there won't be enough hemoglobin. Uh, all the anemias, uh, like um, pernicious anemia, a lack of B12, that you're not making enough hemoglobin. Um, hemolytic anemia, where you're making, but you're, you're removing. Sickle cell anemia, uh, where you're, the red blood cells are uh, clumping together and, and being removed too soon. Anything that causes a decrease in hemoglobin, not enough, um, not enough iron uh, will cause that anemic hypoxia. Now, anemic hypoxia is hypoxia due to anemia. Not all anemia will lead to hypoxia, uh, although usually to a certain extent. Now, there's also circulatory hypoxia, very similar to anemic, It's but the hemoglobin levels are, are correct. What happens is blood flow is decreased. So this, these would be anything 
that causes um, low cardiac output. Um, so this could be heart disease. This could be myocardial infarction uh, where you're not doing it. This is, um, yeah, um, blood pressure things. Right. So the, the blood carries enough oxygen. You're just not getting the blood to where it needs to go. That would be circulatory. And then histotoxic hypoxia is anything that, that prevents the exchange of uh, gas, internal respiration the, from the blood to the tissues. So this would be th various poisons. Cyanide is one of them. Um, carbon monoxide uh, will be involved in this kind of thing too. Cyanide is the big one. Okay, so if you remember back to AMP, there is um, there is the respiratory membrane where things have to um, cross. But really from a patho pathology point of view, we can lump these barriers together. So uh, a lack of surfactant will mean not enough ventilation. It would be too difficult to, to breathe. Thickness in the uh, respiratory membrane, um, not enough interstitial fluid, uh, problems of the capillary membrane. A lot of uh, gases are carried in the plasma, not enough red blood cells will all add up to the same thing, that not enough oxygen will get to where it needs to go. Uh, or similarly, not enough carbon dioxide gets to leave um, the body. It can lead to hypercapnia or hypoxia. If these things are too efficient, it can lead to hypocapnia and uh, too much oxygen. Okay. So um, acute respiratory failure is when the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood drops below 60 millimeters of mercury. So that's hypoxemia. There is not enough oxygen in the blood. Uh, normally, blood levels are around 100. Once it gets below 60, it's really uh, bad news. When the partial pressure of carbon dioxide gets above 50, we end up with hypercapnia. Uh, and that's going to affect the pH, as we know from the acid-base balance. So pH is going to drop because there will be the, the hypercapnia will lead to too much carbonic acid, and uh, you will end up with a pH dropping below 7.3. Uh, so what what causes this ex, ex, gas exchange impairment um, can be things like pneumonia, not enough surface area uh, available, emphysema, uh, parts of the lung that are incapable of um, from scar tissue and damage, asthma, not enough uh, ability to ventilate past. Um, obstructed, constricted bronchioles. Uh, respiratory dis distress syndrome can lead to this. But no matter what, this is going to lead to this pH imbalance, this hypoxia, hypoxia hypoxemia, hypercapnia, which, which manifests as headache, as we saw in the last section, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, confusion, uh, decreased levels of consciousness, so people, stupor is the is a decreased level, coma is a complete loss of consciousness. So, uh, so it, there's kind of a scale of decreasing level of consciousness. Uh, restlessness, agitation, tremors, hypertension at first because the, the 
body will start to um, to try and deliver as much oxygen as it can by by bringing blood to the tissues quicker. But then that will be followed by a hypotension. Blood pressure will drop because the tachycardia goes so high that there's no time for filling. And uh, so cardiac output drops with the tachycardia. And then that, then that exacerbates itself. Um, so at first hypertension, then hypotension. Okay, um, there's a bunch of different infections that can uh, affect the upper respiratory. Uh, there are things like the common cold, uh, influenza. Those things are, are quite common and uh, probably don't need to be gone over here. <coughs> One of the... Uh, Serious things, especially in a pediatric floor or pediatric practice, are, is this idea of croup versus epiglottitis. Now, the the passages, the the um, pharyngeal, uh, the pharynx, the the laryngeal pharynx, uh, is. Uh, quite small in kids. They, they don't have a big opening. So the ratio between the size of the lumen and the thickness of the mucosa is actually smaller than in adults. Adults, the mucosa doesn't get any thicker in adults, but the lumen gets much larger. So in little kids, the lumen is small, the, the mucosa stays the same thickness. What this means is that a slight thickening of the mucosa due to inflammation or anything like that really can impact and, and limit the passage of air through the, the lumen. And uh, this can lead to a couple of things. Now, we'll start with, with croup. Uh, really, croup usually is caused by a virus. Uh, it affects the larynx, the, the trachea, and the bronchi. The virus does, but uh, w what happens is the virus gets into the epithelium of the mucosa and causes inflammation in that epithelium. That epithelium therefore gets a little bit larger. It swells a little bit, which then limits the um, the size of the lumen. When it limits the size of the lumen, it causes uh, increased airway resistance. The what happens is then the child, in order to ventilate, has to get past these these points of restriction so oftentimes there's a, a a cough and it's a it's called a croupy cough it's a, it's a it's a barking <laughs> cough uh, and you get this thing called inspiratory strider what happens is as the as the kid tries to breathe in it had it almost whistles past the uh, the um, restriction they go <laughs> As they bring it, as they try and bring the air in, there's a there's a sound. Um, for some reason, it seems to get worse at night, uh, much to the chagrin of parents. Um, it's interesting. It happens oftentimes in the winter, and it's usually in pretty young kids, like preschoolers. Um, now. You can just imagine what happens when, if it was your kid, what would you do? If you, your kid has got this barking cough and a <laughs> sound and having trouble breathing, you're probably going to get him to emerge. The chances are good you're not going to warm up the car for 10 minutes before you load the kid in the car and, and head off to emerge. So what happens is they load the kid in the car 
and the, off they drive to the hospital. Well, the kid then is breathing cold air. And as we know, cold decreases inflammation. So the inflammation goes down. By the time you get to the hospital, the strider is gone. Uh, it's, uh, and parents will be saying, no, but you should have heard him 10 minutes ago. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you end up working a merge, you will see this a lot. Um, friends of mine that work triage tell me that it's a very common thing. Um, what you want to cause is uh, vasodilation. So what they, they give these kids is epinephrine. Uh, it just eases the breathing because epinephrine causes vasodilation it or um, bronchodilation causes vasoconstriction, but bronchodilation and that bronchodilation lessens the problem. Um, it's scary for parents, but it and it can be difficult on the child as children. The child can get very anxious, which then exacerbates the problem but it's not particularly life-threatening. Now, a very similar thing is epiglottitis. So uh, what this is, is inflammation uh, of the epiglottis and the, uh, the larynx. Uh, it happens, in again, in young kids, preschoolers. Um, and what happens is that the, the epiglottis gets too big to move freely in the larynx. And it gets caught. So they, they have pain when they swallow because in order to swallow, uh, the epiglottis has to move and it hurts. So, uh, so they, they don't swallow as much. So one of the first manifestations that you see is that they drool a lot. Now, uh, this often happens with uh, homophilus influenza. Uh, it doesn't affect kids over that age because they're big enough that the, that the lumen is substantially larger uh, and on a ratio with the thickness of the, uh, the mucosa. So it happens in these young kids because that ratio. Um, so what what happens is they they're unable to swallow, and if the the epiglottis gets stuck in the down position, they're unable to breathe. Um, it it is very. Um, very uh, frightening, right? and uh, the epiglottis turns bright red because it's really inflamed. Uh, they, it sounds a lot like croup because there's this inspiratory strider. They have to get the air past this inflamed epiglottis. One of the big scary things about this is that um, if you use a tongue depressor, to to look down, the act of pushing the tongue up against the tongue depressor closes the epiglottis, and uh, it can go from painful swallowing to stuck and impossible breathing, and that's a that's a respiratory emergency. I, uh, you have to open that airway immediately. So oftentimes the examination can actually cause the, uh, it to go to a very uh, critical situation. So if you're suspecting epiglottitis, you have to be very careful about uh, the examination. It can be fatal and it has been fatal. To a lot of kids. Okay, lung cancer. Lung cancer affects a lot of people. Um, 
there's a couple of different types of, of cancers. Uh, there's squamous cell, there's adenocarcinoma, large cell uh, carcinoma, and small cell carcinoma. So really, the different types depend on what um, what type of cell is involved. The squamous cell carcinomas, uh, they, they account for uh, some place around a third of uh, the cases. They, they are, seem to originate near the central bronchi, like where the, at the hilus, where the, um, the bronchi enter the lungs. Uh, the, it metastasizes via lymph and lymph nodes, and the, the, it's about 100 days, um, so about three months to, for it to double in size. Um, which is difficult when they're found, but, you know, doubling in size from, uh, you know, one millimeter to two millimeters. So this can go on a long time before it becomes noticeable. Another slightly over a third uh, of the cases are adenocarcinomas. They're found in the periphery of the lungs. Uh, they're a little slower growing, uh, and they metastasize uh, through blood, so they go uh, to more distant organs. Um, they, they become glandular uh, inside, so the, the perineal plastic syndromes are more... Uh, uh, more prevalent in these. So uh, a much more rare one, 5 to 10% of cases, is a large cell carcinoma. Um, they, you get clusters. Uh, there's a little quicker growing, growing than adenocarcinomas, uh, and they met to, uh, via blood to distant organs. Small cell carcinoma, uh, so they they end up taking up space. They compress the uh, the airways. They're they're found um, on the bronchi, so you end up with a wheezing sound, and they're very rapid growing uh, a month to double in size. Main cause of of all of these things is smoking. Uh, or exposure to smoke. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. When I was in school, we were just starting to talk about the effects of secondhand smoke. Now they talk about the effects of thirdhand smoke. Um, the manifestations of this really depend on which of the malignancies there are, uh, where it's found. If it's found right on the bronchi and is and causes an obstruction, whether it's there are perineoplastic syndromes and um, inappropriate hormone release, uh, that kind of thing, uh, whether it's metastasized or not, um, because the clinical manifestations of METs, like if it's m metastasized to liver, you're going to have maybe blood clotting problems, edema, things like that, uh, more so than if it stays right in the lungs. Um, Body-wide, outside of the lungs itself, you end up with uh, weight loss, uh, anemia. You get clubbing of the fingertips, and that has to do with, uh, with problems of hypoxia. And um, you get compression of the superior vena cava uh, sometimes because, um, because of the space that the, the tumor is taking up. And then that means that you don't get drainage um, from the upper half of the body. So face and, uh, and arms will start to get edematous. And while the lower, uh, the inferior vena cava is still working properly. So you don't get it. So it's a very strange, it's not like a systemic edema all over, which would indicate liver issues, but it's more just face, neck, and arms. Within the thorax, uh, they have trouble breathing, 
difficulty breathing, uh, cough, chest pain, um, uh, increased sputum. They, it can start to paralyze nerves uh, and compress nerves, so you can get a hoarseness, hoarseness and, uh, in the sound of the voice. Um, phrenic nerve, you can, you can have paralysis of the diaphragm. Uh, you, what can sometimes happen is atelectasis, which is a partial collapse of a segment of the lung. Um, and that just can be because it erodes through and into the pleural space and you can get um, a pneumothorax. You can have pleural effusions, which is we'll talk about later, but it's, uh, it's fluids going into the pleural space and, and causing difficulties. So uh, none of this sounds very pleasant at all. Uh, and it is a very common malignancy and in your practice you will definitely see it. So uh, I'm going to end this video with the pleural space disorders. I'll pick up uh, the, with another video after this. But the pleural space is the space between the outside of the lungs and the inside of the, the chest walls. It's, a, it's the, the, serous, the serous membrane, the pleura, and it's the space between it. Um, and there can be problems with this. Now remember, in order to breathe in, you have to have a lower pressure in the pleural space than you have in the lungs. So what you don't want is equal pressure in the, in the two because then what happens is there's nothing that's going to keep the lungs expanding. Um, so, uh, so the first one we'll talk about is pneumothorax, which means air in that space. Um, there's uh, air accumulates in that space. Now, there's something called tension pneumothorax, which uh, results from um, uh, from trauma usually, and I'll I'll go through it in in a in a second. But pneumothorax itself is there's an accumulation of air for whatever reason. Sometimes it's an opening to the outside, like a trauma where, uh, like a stabbing or a puncture injury, uh, and through the chest wall, and air can, uh, from the outside, atmospheric pressure goes in to the uh, pleural space, and the pleural space pressure then equalizes to atmospheric pressure, and there's nothing then to keep the the lung expanded because the the pressure through the open bronchi means that pressure inside the lungs equalizes to atmospheric pressure so inside and outside the lungs are both atmospheric pressure the lungs collapse um, so uh, So this is just normal pneumothorax. But what would happen if you had a puncture injury? Well, we'll start from the outside. So, um, sorry, pneumothorax can also happen from something called blebs, uh, air that comes down through the normal into the lungs and through the bronchi, into the alveoli. But the alveoli have eroded out and are in contact. There's a hole from the lung into the pleural space air will just go right through the alveoli and into the pleural space and still result in a pneumothorax. Now tension pneumothorax happens if you can imagine almost a valve. Picture um, a, uh, a puncture injury where the flap of skin is hanging over the, the injury. When you breathe in you're expanding the chest wall, you're making the thorax bigger, so pressure goes down. It will suck air through the hole into the pleural space. The lung is collapsed, air is in the pleural space. When you try to exhale, you are pushing, you, you, the pressure increases in the 
thoracic space and the pleural space. And it pushes the, the flap of skin closed. Uh, air can't escape out that hole, but air also can't escape out the bronchi because the lungs are in the way. So the air gets trapped in the pleural space. The next breath you take in, what happens is the uh, air, more air comes into that pleural space. And then when you try and exhale, more air is trapped. So what happens here is that there's a buildup of air pressure on the side where there's the puncture. The, uh, so the air can enter the pleural space, but can't get out. So the lung on the side of the puncture, the ipsilateral lung, collapses, right? And then the pressure that's in that, that space starts pushing the mediastinum towards the other side. It can get bad enough that that everything will start to move, like the heart and everything will start to move away from the uh, the side with the injury, and then start to compress the opposite lung. It can get to the point where the opposite lung is under so much pressure that the pleural space in there can't expand and that pressure goes up till it exceeds um, atmospheric pressure then that lung collapses uh, that obviously is not compatible with life having both lungs collapse the the problem the thing about the pneumothorax is that both pleural spaces for left and right lung are not connected to each other. So you can have a pneumothorax in one side, but not the other, and therefore keep on breathing on the, on the good side. The tension pneumothorax becomes, um, becomes a much more dangerous situation. Um, so what do you see? Uh, if you might get... Uh, small little air pockets in there. You don't, you don't detect them usually, uh, but it can happen in, in small areas. What you do see is tachycardia. Because of, um, of this lack, oxygen levels are gonna go down, lack of ventilation, et cetera, uh, heart rate will speed up in order to compensate for it. You won't hear breath sounds on the affected side, especially if, um, if the uh, lung has already collapsed, when the, that lung collapses, you don't hear air passing through the bronchi. You get a hyper resonance, so that when you when you tap on the chest, it it resonates because now that side of the thorax is virtually hollow. Um, you get chest pain on the affected side because when that when that lung collapses, it hurts can become very difficult to breathe. It feels like somebody's sitting on you uh, because you're trying to ventilate and you only have one lung to do it with. If it turns into a, a tension pneumothorax, the, it'll go to the point where the trachea will even shift. Uh, neck veins will distend. You get this hyper resonance on the side. Um, and then air starts to build up subcutaneously under the skin. Uh, so we call this subcutaneous emphysema. Air goes right into the, the various tissues. Uh, this is a real clinical emergency. Uh, people will die if it's not dealt with. Now, sometimes all you have to do to change a, a tension pneumothorax into a pneumothorax is tape over the hole uh, and and prevent air from going in on the, into the pleural space on the inhale. Uh, that will at least slow it down from getting worse. Uh, so pneumothorax, air in the space, it builds up and we start to get this deviation. 
this is what subcutaneous emphysema looks like. You can see, the, especially here around the eyes, and you can see the air building up subcutaneously here in the, in the tissues, uh, especially the areolar connective tissues. Um, yeah, it's really <laughs> not a pleasant looking thing. On x-rays, this is a tension pneumothorax. You can see that the whole mediastinum has shifted over to this side, and you can see that this side is very clear. You don't see any of the hilar. You don't see any of the, of the lung tissue on this x-ray. This is just a space filled with air now, and it's pushing the mediastinum over. And the other lung is fitting into this space here, which is not big enough. So pneumothorax is, is, is when air does this. Now you can also get liquid going into this space and it cause, can cause the same sort of symptomatology, but it is liquid rather than air. So uh, we call some, some of this we call pleural effusion. So uh, pleural effusion is when there's a pathologic amount of fluid in that cavity and it happens because of another disease process there's normally fluid in there it's serous fluid in that anything that increases the amount of serous fluid up to an abnormally high amount can cause this pleural effusion um, normally we make it we reabsorb it we make it we reabsorb it we make it we reabsorb it it's constantly being changed and there's a constant movement of it but if we start making it too quickly or reabsorbing it too slowly, then that fluid builds up. That is normally known as a transudate. Uh, the transudates really are low in protein. They have uh, low lactate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme. Um, it happens with heart failure. It, it's really just an edema sort of thing. Um, sometimes it happens due to liver disease and, and, um, and it's caused uh, by, it caused, it's caused by the same thing that causes acetes, not enough albumin being made. Uh, kidney disease can do this, nephrotic syndrome, um, myxedema, which is uh, a thyroid issue. Uh, all, these are all edematous sort of things. And uh, if the, the pleural space starts to fill up, it can actually increase the pressure in that pleural cavity. And if it gets higher than atmospheric pressure, it can cause collapse or partial collapse of the lungs. Now, uh, exudates are really um, liquids that are put there that isn't edematous. It's not, uh, it, it's not an increase in plural fluids. This is other fluids. So uh, infections can cause this, um, pancreatic disease. So exudates are um, inappropriate liquids uh, that can get in there. Blood can get in there. We call that hemothorax. Uh, chest trauma can do it, broken ribs. Um, you end up with blood in that pleural fluid. Uh, and that's uh, that can act as uh, by increasing the, the pressure in the intrapleural space and can cause, a, again, a collapsed lung. Uh, Okay, empyema is a collection of pus, really. Uh, it pus from an infection, and the empyema is going into any body cavity. We're matching it here, so that's into the pleural space. Um, it's it's cellular debris and it's dead bacteria and it's all the stuff that pus. 
is made out of. And if there's enough of it, it can actually cause this pleural effusion. It can it can increase the um, the pressure in the pleural space. So, the things that cause transudates would be anything that causes an increased hydrostatic pressure or a decreased osmotic pressure. So, uh, liver disease that where you're not making enough albumin, uh, increased blood pressure, especially increased local blood pressure, uh, pulmonary hypertension, things like that. Anything that causes that. inappropriate capillary exchange. Exudate is increased production, uh, they increase permeability of membranes, uh, impaired lymphatic drainage, you're not being able to take that stuff away. Empyema is from uh, in infections, and it's because it's pus. Hemothorax tends to be trauma. So, you can imagine that, that the clinical manifestations are everything from no symptoms to, to really severe clinical emergencies. So it, and it, it depends on the, the cause and the size of the effusion and, um, and the other manifestations. Like, so if it's a trauma, broken ribs, et cetera. Um, so it could be completely asymptomatic uh, if there's not very much of the fluid, like so a little bit of pus, not, not really symptomatic. Um, when, when it starts to build up and the ventilation isn't happening properly, then you can end up with, with dyspnea. De decreased chest wall movements can, can happen because of it. Uh, because what happens is the, the pressure will build up and it, it pushes the chest out and makes it more difficult to, for the chest to, to come in on uh, expiration. It can, uh, it can lead to pain, uh, pleurisy. So uh, pain on, with pleurisy hurts more when you breathe in than breathe out. And it's, it's like a, a stabbing, knifing pain on inspiration. It can lead to dry cough. Because this is outside of the, uh, the lungs, it, it increases pressure, which makes you want to cough, but there's, there's nothing productive about it because it's not caused by, by mucus or things built up in the lungs. Um, if the lung collapses, you get an absence of breath sound. You, get, you can get um, a dullness to percussion at first, if the lung collapses, or if it's a pneumothorax, uh, which is really not pure pleural effusion, but you can get uh, increased resonance there. So that's one of the ways you can tell an effusion cause collapse from a pneumothorax. Um, you get decreased tactile fremitus over the affected area. There, I posted uh, a YouTube video on tactile fremitus, but that is being able to feel the voice through the chest wall. You usually put the bony part of your hand on the chest wall at various levels and ask the person to repeat uh, blue moon or 99, something that, that, that's got that low pitch repeated um, sound and you you try and palpate the vibrations of the of that sound through the chest wall uh, and that's called tactile fremitus and very good video that I posted about it so please take four minutes and watch it uh, if it's bad enough you can end up with this tension and the trachea will start to shift contralaterally away from 
the side with uh, with the problem. <laughs>